Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. After two years of the Republican and Trump tax cut, or officially the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the numbers are in. Is it a winner or a loser? Well, maybe it's somewhere in between. That's what we'll be looking at today. Uh, We always try to talk about why you should care. I think this one's hopefully pretty pretty straightforward. Something they say, Lance, right? Uh, The certainties in life, uh, death, and taxes. I've heard that before. I've heard it. So, so if you're not certain about taxes, uh, hopefully this shows for you because we're going to break it down and, and try to give you an idea of understanding if it's been a good deal or not. Uh, and the reason that's important is it gives you an idea of what you should be advocating to your lawmakers. One of the tough things about taxes is usually it comes down to a branding job of whether or not people have convinced you. And on today's show, we're going to try to draw that line in the sand and help you really understand it. And we've got two years of data to look at, and that's the key. But of course, we couldn't begin a conversation on the economy and taxes without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Hey, we get to talk about the president's policy two days in a row, right? That's right. Or two shows in a row. So. Well, see, I, I originally had titled the episode The Trump Tax Overhaul, but then I thought, no, because this is more just about the the facts of the tax overhaul. That is true. So, you know what I mean? Y- yes, he was part of it, but I don't think that he crafted it. <laughs> but while <laughs> yeah, so. And while you should be interested is because obviously it has affected you in the last two years. Right. Either positively or negatively. Um, so it's affected you in the short term. And then long term, the prediction was that it would eventually bring in more money and work on lowering the deficit. Right. I'm not sure I've heard a government official in the last 18 months mention the deficit, be it a Republican or a Democrat. Yeah. Um, They've gone quiet on But that. we can talk – the article does address that as well. Has it brought in more money to the Treasury to pay down the deficit or is the deficit rising, which is something that I think you know if you're a listener of – current events, you heard a lot of three to five years ago. That was a big, big issue when President Obama was in office and the Republicans were complaining and saying, you have to get us in office and get us in control of Congress because we need to lower the deficit because the future economic welfare of the United States depends on lowering the deficit. And now the Republicans have for two years controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency and got the tax cut through. And then so what happened? Has the deficit gone down? Is the U.S. economic future brighter or not? So, there's, I mean, besides just your pocketbook, what's the future look like? So this article that we're referencing is from the Wall Street Journal today. And as always, if you go to the stateofus.org, it's a great resource. Lance uh, is a big fan of our current website, which you'd hope he is because, you know, he's on the show and everything. But <laughs> but he's not a fan of most websites. So that's why I bring it up because uh, – but we've got the, the Use article Used it today there. though. Yes. Used it today at school. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. See? One of the young men did not believe that I was on a podcast. <laughs> so, so, you know, how we talk about every day how to access it. Well, uh-huh. he didn't listen to podcasts. My flip phone doesn't have podcasts. So – we had to so use just, the computer uh-huh. and we went to the website. Excellent. And he said, hey, there's you because there's a picture of me there. Right, right at the top. Uh-huh. <laughs> so now he believes you, huh? And then he said, oh, so that's your first name because, you know, obviously oh, school right. students yeah, didn't know that. You're but, Mr. Jackson. Yeah. Got and it. Then, but then he could navigate it and he flipped through it and heard my voice. He goes, that really is you. And I'm like, yeah, I told you. Well, see, there you go. Use the state of us.org. So you can follow along there. The article's from the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it, it starts with this. The bottom line, it seems clear that the tax cuts contributed to economic growth, but not enough to pay for themselves, as many of the backers promised. And even some of the intended beneficiaries say the gains haven't been dramatic. So we're going to get into the what's what of this statement because the article goes on to basically lay out 
um, you know, what effect has the tax cut had so far? And it lists uh, a plethora of different ones. We're going to look at five uh, over the course of this segment and the next segment in the show today. So if you want to read all of them, please take a look, but know that we're not, we just don't have the time to do the full comprehensive look. Uh, so the first one is that individuals are paying less of their income in taxes. I tried to Individuals are paying less of their income in taxes. This is at the federal level, state level, overall. For households, the law cut tax rates, increased tax credits for families with children, sharply narrowed the alternative minimum, and expanded the standard deduction. So mostly federal. The minimum amount someone can earn before income tax kicks in. That's the standard deduction. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, it was um, like it was around 6000 and now it's at about 12000 And for married couples, it went from about 12000 to 24000 So that's what they're talking about there. The well, the whole push deduction. there in, in, in layman's terms, or at least my layman's terms, it went from me itemizing <laughs> to taking the standard deduction, which is what they wanted people to do. Right. They, they wanted to get more the idea of the tax cut one of the things was more people to take the standard deduction than to itemize. Than to itemize. And, right. and I fell into that group. I had always I itemized, the, but when the standard went from, when it doubled from 12 to 24, right. I couldn't come up with enough money to continue to itemize. So I just took the standard deduction. And one of the thinkings there is that generally this <clears throat> is less work for individuals and it's less work for the federal government right? because there's just less that people have to check. If you don't know, if you've never done that, if you've never itemized before, what that means is you actually go through and you get into all these specific deductions uh, or credits that you may have. And extra forms that you have to file right. and everything else. And usually it greatly expands the length of your tax return yep. as a result. So there's definitely a benefit to decreasing the number of people that itemize in terms of from a government standpoint. Um, but it goes on to explain the result for almost every income group lower taxes or bigger net refunds. Here, negative tax rates reflect tax refunds that exceed taxes relative to adjusted gross income. So the the deal is it it either means you actually paid less in taxes or it felt like you paid less because you got a bigger refund. Okay. You may not have actually paid any less in taxes, but your refund was bigger. So it felt like you paid less. And so for that aspect of it, it worked. Right. I mean, it did, uh, it achieved its goal in right. that regard. Um, the next one, the change lowered tax revenue projections. So in mid-2017, before the tax law was drafted, uh, the Congressional Budget Office projected that individual and corporate tax collections would keep growing along with the economy. By reducing tax rates for both of those groups, the law generally reduced revenue projections. So basically what we're saying here is overall, the, the amount of tax money coming in is now less than it was before, which is right in line with what we just talked about before. If people are paying less in taxes, we're going to take in less overall in taxes. But they thought, but they said something different was going to happen. Right. Okay. So this is where... Not that it's a failure, but if you're keeping a pro and con or a, a yes or no checklist, people did pay less in taxes, which they said you would, but they said it would also increase the amount of taxes the government took in. Because business spending would pick up, which right. is actually one of the things it mentions that the problem is that it didn't last. It was a- Right. It was a one shot in the dark deal. And actually, the majority of the money that the government is taking in- is now a higher percentage of it is coming from income tax and lower amount and a lower amount is coming in from business. So it's, it's working opposite of what they had said. Yeah. Because the thinking obviously was that, and that's kind of what we were just hinting at the, or the sales pitch was that if people have more money, they'll spend more money, which isn't necessarily untrue because that did happen. The problem is that you have a, you have several generations of Americans now that lived through and uh, at least one that grew up through the Great Recession, right. you know, right. and there's still, so you get this temporary, you know, something changes and it's like, oh, okay, I have a little more to spend. They go spend it, but then they go back to their old habit of 
not spending saving. even mm-hmm. if they can. Right. And that's still a problem that the economy is facing. Mm-hmm. And perhaps part of why it's not growing quite as fast as it typically would. Um, so they, they talked a little bit here and part of the explanation, business investment grew faster at first, but not dramatically. In the fourth quarter of 2018, a broad measure of business investments rose 5.9% over the same quarter in 2017. And here's the key though, but growth soon returned to pre overhaul levels. It has since all but stalled and even fell from the first through the third quarter this year. Um, so we got a one shot deal right. where we saw it increase rapidly and money was brought in from offshore and, and all kinds of things. And we saw a big burst of, uh, if everybody remembers, um, Walmart all of a sudden said, Hey, we're going to pay our workers this. Yep. Okay. That was a one shot deal. It hasn't happened since. So we, we saw it immediately and everybody tried to make it look good because, Again, Walmart got a huge tax break with the new tax law. Right. And so they, and, and they were just, I'm just picking on them because that was the one I think most people would remember. And businesses said, okay, oh, oh, well, we'll share the tax break with our employees. Well, they did that once and that was two and a half years ago. And since then it, it hasn't continued. And so we haven't seen the benefit of the tax break in businesses. So we've got more to talk about. So far, we basically talked about one that delivered as promised um, and that I think Lance and I both feel like, and I think everybody would, is a good thing, right? I mean, individuals are paying less in taxes at face value. If you isolate that from everything else, who doesn't like that? Then change number two uh, didn't pan out quite as it was promised, but there's more to look at, at least three more we're going to get to. And coming in the last segment of the show, we have a couple questions from our producer to answer, Lance, okay. uh, a non-tax professional, you might say. So keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. After two years of the Republican and Trump tax cut, or officially known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the numbers are in, and Lance and I are here to review them. The Wall Street Journal did a nice spread in um, a weekend edition, and it's linked at thestateofus.org. That's what we've been referencing. We've identified one so far that delivered as promised, um, and another one that didn't pan out quite so well. So we've got three more to look at. And in the last segment, we're going to talk to our producer a little bit about a couple of the questions he had and also look at the argument of whether it was a net positive or net negative. We've got two different um, economist types, uh, one from the Council of Economic Advisors and one from the Urban Institute who have a a position to share. So we're going to look at that uh, in the last half. But before we get into our three that we're going to look at in this segment, Lance, Mm -hmm. It's important that we take a second, right, and tell people why we're taking why time we're to do this. There's a lot of there's a lot of noise, right, in the mainstream media right now. Uh, but people who are interested in the signal, what they need to know, uh, they come to the state of us, and that's because of this common goal that we, as a network, True Chat, this network of shows, pursue. What is that goal, Lance? That we're well, after. Well, our mission, our goal, is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. Okay, so we're trying to do that. Uh, we're trying to do that on taxes today. We're right? trying to lay it out there for you. And and here it is. Here's the report. This is what it says. And here's what was promised us. Here's what it's done. Right. And then, then you can decide whether it's good or bad. I mean, you can make your own decisions. Yep. And we try to, I don't know if I'm sure some of our listeners have noticed, we try in the first couple segments. I mean, we always add commentary kind of as we're going, but we save most of the final decision until the last bit of the show. Uh, in part because we want you to kind of be formulating as you're going what you're thinking and see how that lines up uh, with where we come out on things. So let's keep going. Employment increased, Lance. Okay, so this is one of the one of the promises, right? And one of the delivered. Uh, if companies were restrained in their capital investment, there's little question that the la- labor market improved. That was particularly true of those of prime working age, and the improvement was driven at least in part by greater consumer spending. Overall, the U.S. jobless rate touched its lowest level in 50 years. Um, Now, the article does note that 
it believes, you know, and this is where you get into some, we just don't know because right. the economy is a really complicated. The authors of the article <laughs> draw some conclusions that could or could not be, you know, that can be validated right. through this information, but it could be something else as well. Yes. So they definitely attribute, um, you know, part of the jobless rate uh, to the to the tax cut bill. At the same time, they also note that, you know, this is a continuing trend that we've seen post recession mm-hmm. um since about 2011 when it had mostly plateaued and then in 2012 it started on its upward trajectory it's stabilized a little bit more as of late well and you have to take you know the whole immigration policy into account as far as as well if you have sure. fewer immigrants then obviously you know you have fewer people who are looking for jobs. You have fewer citizens. You have the the baby boomers retiring and a smaller group of people coming into the workforce. And that's just going to so there's a grow lot of factors. and grow and grow. So there's a lot of factors looking at that. But but yes, you'd have to argue that it did bring in jobs. Sure. I mean, it, it has helped companies have more money to spend. What it hasn't done, and it, this doesn't address it, but we're going to talk about it um, next week, I think, on, or in the coming weeks on our shows. But um it hasn't meant more in production. Right. So we have more people working, but we're not producing uh, in the the rate that most companies would like to see production go. Well, it's interesting you bring that up too, because the next one is wages also rose. And this one's a little bit of a misnomer because listen here, though minimum wage increases may be affecting pay for all workers as well. And what this is highlighting is actually um, something that, the we can tease it, but we can't say a lot about it. There's a there's an episode that we'll be doing a two parter, uh, in probably sometime in February is when it'll actually come out. But it'll the recording will be happening on a trip here soon that we're taking to New York, um, and we will be diving into kind of the discrepancy between uh, why low wage earners are seeing big increases, but people who have been in the workforce a while aren't. Why are entry level positions seeing bigger increases than the rest? And we've done an epi- we did an episode on that on that already. And it's and we've also we talked to an economist um, who said that you know we're seeing more wage increases in blue collar workers right. than we are white collar workers. Yes. So while the it has gone up, it doesn't go up as much. Because typically blue collar workers don't make as much as white collar workers. So yes, wages have gone up, but the, the person standing at the, at the cash register, them getting a raise isn't as much as some middle manager right. in an accounting office getting a raise. Yeah. And so we've seen the blue collar jobs get the raises, but that doesn't mean that there's a lot of extra money in the economy to be spent, which also though means even though wages have gone up, it hasn't brought in the tax, which back to our topic today, it hasn't brought in the income tax money that the government thought it was going to. Right. And so what it all results in and what it boils down to is what the article says, average hourly earnings for all private sector production and non-supervisory employees went up. The average went up. Right. Um, but like most economic statistics, there's a there's a whole other realm to dive into, and that's part of what we're trying to highlight because it's something we're going to be covering again in the future. Um, and we're going to be talking about, because that's a big part of our show, what to do about it. I think that's the that's the second part of that episode that we're talking about that's coming in February that'll be exciting, is getting some advice from the people that are doing these studies about how how does the economy how do we f- change this trend but it, when this was sold to us it was we're going to give you a tax break but we're going to create more jobs and therefore by creating more jobs we will end up bringing in more tax dollars right through the income tax so that's how we can lower the tax and bring in and that hasn't happened right even though wages have gone up with and employment some, has increased and employment has increased <clears throat> we have not seen excuse me we have not seen the income tax collection pot go up. And that is um, the last one that we're reviewing, which is simply entitled, There is a Price Tag. 
absent spending cuts or robust growth, the federal deficit will rise. Proponents said the law would pay for itself. So far, it hasn't generated enough growth for that. So what they're saying here, and this is the key, because again, this is one of those, you know, it goes back to our whole all or nothing thing that people do is people are, you either have to say that the tax uh, bill was all good or all bad, you know, and the reality is what these professionals who do this for a living is saying is, well, neither one of those is really true. You know, it did uh, increase employment and it did help wages go up, you know, and people are paying less in taxes, but it didn't, even though it did those things, which is what Republicans said it would do, the big thing it didn't do that they said those would cause is for it to pay for itself, right. which it's not doing. It has not done that. Yes. And that's just the reality. I mean, you can you can rant and rave all you want, just like you can rant and rave against it if you really hate it. But the reality is there are more people working and wages are going up. You well, know? and you can draw, you know, but again, then you get into your inferences and sure. everything else. And you can have your opinion and you would be right. Sure. Even using <laughs> the facts. We could you and I could both use the same set of information. And you could argue that it's been a positive, and I could argue that it's a negative, and we can both pull out facts to support it. And therein lies part of the problem is, and it depends on, then you have to, and this is where we, we, we tend to disagree as voters when we start to prioritize what is the most important issue. And you and I, for the last seven years or so, have argued about the budget deficit being one of the big gorillas out there that we should be afraid of. Yep. And this was sold to us. I think both of us were like, oh, well, they say if we do this, it's going to lower the deficit. Well, it hasn't done that. No. It has done these other things. Not yet. Which is all you said, <laughs> which is, as you said, are good if we don't, you know, get into the minutia sure. of that people still don't have enough money to live on. And da, da, da. But anyway, yeah. but the bottom line is we're seeing, to me, we're seeing the the deficit still rise. And that's a major concern, I believe, still to both of us. Sure. That's one thing that you and I have been fairly consistent on is that we need to do something for deficit reduction because that's that's probably as big as climate control or any other issue that you want to talk about into the future for the United States. Yeah. And is, is the deficit. And it's this isn't addressing it, at least in the first two years. And that's something that Lance and I, like he said, have been on for years, long before Trump was president. Um, it was. It's always been something that's frustrated me that the Democrats have never taken on as something that they acknowledge as important, you know. And now it's upsetting that the Republicans have abandoned it. But right, because because it was the Republicans who were hounding on right. the deficit. You know, Jim yeah. Jordan and all those and people, all they, those Republicans, now they've gotten in power and it's like, and all they're doing is, is exacerbating the problem and yep. they're not even mentioning it. Well, they can't mention it because they complained about it for eight years. Right. And now they're doing the same thing. The deficit is still growing. And you mm -hmm. might say, well, it's not growing as quickly or what? Okay, but it's still going up and that's not fixing the problem. Right. You know, and then, but then you run into, okay, well, if you lower the deficit, then we might not see the economy doing as well as it is. And, and that argument. So again, it comes down to what is it that, what is it that you value? What piece of the economy do you value as to how well you think the tax cut has done two years in? Right. And, and I think it, it comes down to, you know, the tax cut or I'm try I was trying to think back to an Obama example, the, the stimulus package. Right. Um, we were critical. We've been critical of other things that didn't deliver the way they were promised they would deliver. Um, and I mean, we know that here in our small town, you know, there's, right. there's this lovely story of the main drag where we got all this money to redo it and put in nice sidewalks and street lamps. And the contractors that came in didn't use any new local employees. They brought everybody in that was already part of their crew from outside the area. So we got all this nice money from the Obama stimulus package, but it didn't do anything for workers here, which what, what that was the promise of what it was. So it's, it's one of those things of just make sure you understand it doesn't negate the good things that it does. Like we got new lights, you right. know, it's, it's nice that we got new lights and we're going to get new paving and new sidewalks. Right. And but it's the, it's the promises made, promises kept, making sure that we're keeping those in power accountable for what they tell us is going to happen. So we've got lots more to come. We're going to answer some questions from 
the famous Bradley Butch uh, about this. I, and I think they're, I think they will shed some light on people who aren't as interested all the time uh, on the tax front. So keep it here on the state of us, and we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. After two years of the Republican and Trump tax cut, the numbers are in. Lance and I have broken some of them down. And it's important to know that we did not get to all of it, okay? Uh, Even the Wall Street Journal article we were referencing really can't get to all of it. It's just there's a lot to look at. So if you want some more information, uh, you can check out thestateofus.org and read the full article from the Wall Street Journal there. Uh, but we're going to get into, hopefully you have a high enough level understanding, we're going to get into um, kind of the, is this a net positive? Is this a net negative? And I think part of the way to analyze that is with a couple questions from our producer, uh, Bradley Butch. He he got two questions together and Lance and I will do what we can to to answer them. So my first question can be directed towards Justin. As I was reading the article, I came across a lot of things that seemed to be positive for big corporations um, after these, after the Job Act and the tax cuts were implemented. So my question is, what are some of the negative effects a lower tax rate can have on corporations? Hmm, Lance is shaking his head already. What are what are some of the negative effects a lower tax rate can have on corporations? So this is it is a different question because typically the typically the question that people put forward is he didn't ask me so I don't I don't get to the, answer it first. You got to answer it first. I got my answer though. I know the typically people ask what are the negative effects of a higher tax rate on corporations? They they're not usually concerned with the negative effects because the assumption typically Bradley right is that. The lower the tax rate, the better for the corporation. But there's a reason that assumption, um, while sure, is partly true. Um, I mean, it would it would be a lie to say that it's just totally false. Um, on the other hand, it goes back to that whole idea of gluttony, okay? Uh, which is that it might be nice, right, if Burger King was free for Lance. Uh, he might enjoy it being free. But his doctor would probably tell him that that's not such a great thing. Uh, it would be much better for Burger King to probably cost twice what it costs right now. So I think that that might be uh, the most apt way to explain it in that it's good for their bottom line, but their bottom line isn't the only thing that's important to a business. The health of their employees um, you know, the, their economic and environmental impacts are important. Um, and I think we've seen in recent years at least a lip service shift in the direction of starting to care about some of that stuff more again, because it hasn't always been that companies totally never cared about it. Um, but they always, you know, they have their motivations. They're out for their bottom line because that's, that's why they exist is for their bottom line. Most companies, um, there are some companies and there's some new classes of companies these days. B corporations are catching on. They didn't exist when TrueChat uh, was created. Otherwise, we might be one. And they are organizations that are organized to make money, but they're organized to make money uh, without contradicting their principle or their goal that they're working towards as an organization. And I think that fits pretty well with TrueChat. You know, yes, we want to make money. Yes, uh, we are out here to, you know, to to have a good bottom line. But at the same time, what our main motivation for that is to accomplish um, that mission statement. So I think there's negative effects because they can take it too far. They can get out of hand. They can cut back too much and then they can damage themselves in the long run. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I think I'm curious to hear Lance's answer, though. He looks like he has a good answer. Well, <laughs> Justin's on the right track. There is nothing wrong for business. <clears throat> That's why you said you read all those good things because it allows business to make more money. And then where the problem lies though for business with low, there's nowhere for them to go when they stop making money. We can't do anything else really for them. So as I, I say that as a government. So without as long as they don't get, check. <laughs> as long as they don't get lazy and they reinvest the money. They they take the capital and do something positive with it to show that they're going to continue to grow as a company. Then 
things will be okay. The problem is historically, once companies start getting easy money, they can t- they 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 start to abuse it. Justin used the term gluttony, but I I would say they become slothful of the seven deadly sins. They become lazy and they start to just assume they're always going to make money like this. It's, I mean, hand over fist and they're always going to see the stock prices go up and they're always going. And so they quit doing the things that made them successful anyway. And then when they struggle, then there's nothing else for the government to go to, to stimulate their business. Like Justin said, other than the government bailing them out. I guess that kind of leads into my next question. Um, as I was reading the article, a lot of these things seemed pretty distant from me, like reading how companies store their money in foreign countries for lower tax rates and all these big corporations and then big numbers and all that. So my second question for Lance is, how does the Jobs Act and the tax cuts directly affect me as a consumer or citizen? Well, um, right now it's getting you uh, – there are more jobs out there. So as you start to enter the workforce here shortly, either immediately or in – four to six years, whatever you decide to get out of school and whatever degree you want. Um, but right now there is money out there available for you to go to school. There um, are jobs out there for you to work while you're trying to go to school. Hopefully there will continue to be a job there waiting for you when you get out. So all it, it's all of those things um, as, as well as then – you aren't going to, as you're making that money, you're not going to pay into, you're not going to pay in taxes. So you're going to have more of your own money to keep, to get started in your life. Um, that's how I can sell it to you positively. If I were really you, I'd be real worried about it though, because if you look where, where, I, where my concern is, and my, re, my concern is I'm at the other end of the spectrum from you. And right now it looks really, really good for me to retire because I've invested all of this money over the last 30, 35 years. And right now the business businesses are booming. So I'm seeing a great return on my investments. But the problem will be at some point in the next six months, in the next six years, there will be a downturn in the economy. That's only natural. And so the how it affects you is you have to be able to plan for that and you don't have the capital from which to do that. So it could affect you in a, in a, in a negative way while you're in the middle of trying to get started by either going to school or getting started in your business when you finish school, um, be that in your medical field or art or whatever that you do, whatever route you take money could get really tight and then it's going to be difficult for you as someone who's just coming into the field of earning money to, to try to make it. Uh, whereas for me, it's like, and this is one thing why I, I'm still working is because is that there's no guarantee that I'm going to, my money's going to be worth this much five years from now. I'm still going to be alive, but what am I going to live off of? So how's it going to affect him? Yeah, I, I won't rehash the positives because I think you pretty much nailed all of all of the the major ways that it can be a benefit. I mean, the biggest thing being you have options. And I think that's always Lance and I talk about that all the time. Having the opportunity to make decisions about where you want to go and where you want to be and not be forced into things, that's always that's always good. Um as far as the negative goes, um, I I think the big one for me is the, and when I say me, I mean me and you, Bradley. I mean, people, millennials, Gen Z, uh, the bill's gonna come due someday, you know, and nobody knows what that means when that happens because it's literally never happened. You know, we don't know what happens. Um, and the fact that we don't know what happens to me is the concerning thing because we can theorize all we want about how relevant or not the deficit is. Uh, but at the end of the day, we don't know and we won't know until it comes due. And the fact that we don't know should be enough for us to want to avoid finding out. Um, because in the worst case scenarios, it is the collapse of the American society that you and I know. Um, I mean, it's the end of our modern world uh, as we know it right now, you know, and we wouldn't live to see the world climb back out of it. So that's the worst case scenario. 
<laughs> so, so if you want to know the the negative, he's raining doom and gloom on you, man. Right. I, I was, it's, it's the cla- collapse of the global market system, um, I, and, and I don't I don't mean that as like that's a crazy possibility. I think it, it's a realistic thing because nobody wants to talk about it. So I think that that's the that's the conundrum from the negative side that you and I are going to be faced with. Like Lance said, the the value that we have as a nation still far out exceeds our debt. Um, and in the business world, uh, that means you're okay. You know, that means it's not a problem yet. The problem is that the trajectory is that it keeps getting worse all the time. Uh, the amount that we produce versus the amount that we owe, the gap between those is shrinking. And as it gets closer, the more danger we're in. And that's why the economy is good. So I know that's a bigger world thing, but we all have a part to do in educating uh, ourselves so that we can know who to vote for and that we don't vote for people that propose things that just make the problem worse, right? Uh, Even if there's not anybody advocating to make it better, which is a problem, (laughs) as Lance and I have said. This is the old saying here at True Chat is, you have a problem. It's either going to get better or it's going to get worse. If you continue to avoid it, it will get worse. And that's in a nutshell what we're trying to say is that we have a problem and we're avoiding it. And so the problem is just going to get worse. And the longer we avoid it, the more catastrophic the solution will become. Exactly. And the tax bill isn't the reason we have the deficit, but it's another example of lawmakers ignoring the deficit. We're taking care of the short term and pushing the problem on down the road. Yeah. And we can't, I mean, we just can't do it forever. At some point, it will catch up with us. So, and just because just we promised it, it's in the article. Yeah. We didn't get to it because of Bradley's good questions. <laughs> but when you read what the experts say about the tax bill, yeah, there are two very different conclusions. Yes. So even the experts don't agree. So I would direct you to the article since we've run out of time again uh, today, but direct you to the article so that you don't think we're lying to you because the two experts both have a different take on the exact same set of numbers that we have just talked about. So right. please take a look at that, uh, even though we didn't get a chance to talk about what they had to say. Where do they take a look at that, Lance? Well, they can find that. Justin, everybody knows that. They can find that at thestateofus.org. You you took a, a kid there the today, link. right? On the I website. Did. You mentioned yep. that at the beginning of the show. Yep. So I, here you go. Kevin, Kevin, there's your shout out. I took oh. Kevin there today. He said, can you shout me out on You're the gonna show? You're going to have to remind him. Okay. That he, he, he He's going to have to listen to the show. To the end. Shout right. out. Yeah. Well, I'll tell him where. I'll make him listen oh, to the okay. whole show. Somewhere <laughs> in the show, I mentioned your name. That's right. You got to listen. Find it. Uh, so, Lance, we've we've told people, right, and this is part of that state of us uh, policy. We've told people that expanding the conversation is important. I don't know how else we can say that because things like what we're talking with Bradley about, that's why he enjoys being here, folks, is because there's a lot of people that don't get this and it's not because they don't care. It's because nobody's telling them. It's your job today. It's your job to bring one other person into the fold. Help them know because boy, knowledge is power. So Lance, if our listeners are going to go invite somebody else to tune in, this is a syndicated radio show. It's also a podcast. Uh, where can they listen to it as a podcast? Well, they can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or anywhere else fine podcasts are found. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, for being on today's program, and as always, for doing a fantastic job of production. Thank you all very much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the chain. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.